Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with PBS 39 in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Today we are chatting with Dr. Brian Nestor, President and CEO of the Lehigh Valley Health Network. Brian has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Brian, for joining us today. Happy to be here, thank you. So Dr. Nestor, you are running a tremendously complicated organization that is responsible for providing health care to a wide variety of people with a huge number of needs. Mm -hmm. Talk about your journey to mm -hmm. this position and the organization that you serve. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, it has been a journey. It's probably a good way to put it. I, uh, uh, as mentioned, I'm, I'm a physician. I'm an ER doc by training. Uh, and was in, fifth, in Philadelphia for about 15 years before I came to the Lehigh Valley in uh, 1998 uh, to run the emergency department at Muhlenberg, uh, which was a new merger for the organization. Uh, but my exposure to Lehigh Valley Hospital came during my training, late 80s, early 90s, where we were exported uh, from Philadelphia for, to see blunt trauma. And at the uh, Lehigh Valley Health Network a Hospital at Cedar Crest was actually the uh, busiest on-scene helicopter system for blunt trauma at the time. So I got exposure to the docs and the nurses and said, what an extraordinary culture. Always wanted to come back and finally got a shot at it in 1998. And then just had progressive uh, administrative roles as the company grew. Uh, and uh, I'm fortunate to be in a, in a position where I, I can do the best I can to help our community. And not every doctor can actually make that transition. It's a totally different set of skills. Mm -hmm. There are certain aspects, though, in mm -hmm. terms of, of uh, understanding process mm -hmm. and understanding sequence sure. and being able to build uh, treatment plans mm -hmm. um, in the moment that mm -hmm. uh, do have purchase when yeah. it comes to uh, administration and, and understanding the life of, of the docs and the nurses mm -hmm. and the care providers throughout is so important to this role. What do you think is the is the key to your ability to function as an administrator mm -hmm. um, of of this uh, tremendously complex mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. uh, that is responsible for uh, the survival, the the health, the welfare, the happiness of mm -hmm. so many people? Well, you know, first and foremost, what allows us to focus on, if you will call them the the business end of the of of the company. Uh, of the organization, uh, having extraordinary quality team uh, delivering care 365, 24-7, uh, takes a lot of pressure off. Uh, my issues day to day and that of our executive team is largely not around those issues. We deliver uh, routinely high quality care. No one's perfect, we're not perfect, but we do a great job at that. So part of your approach is to let the experts do Absolutely. the thing that, that they do so yeah. well. And those outcomes have been built on the shoulders of generations of providers before us, and we just continue to refine that, and we're very, very proud of those results, and we'll continue to, to try and do even better. That allows you time, though, okay? And if you're also financially healthy, again, built on the shoulders of other, other administrations, if you will, uh, you can spend time on trying to uh, tweak the system, change the system to take care of more people at higher quality and lower cost. That's actually uh, a mandate from the federal government called the triple aim, better health, better care, and better cost that came with the Affordable Care Act. So I would say for the last 15 years, we've been really focusing on what we saw as a looming challenge in our industry, where we had a huge boomer generation coming at the Affordable Care Act, there were mandates for Medicaid to be expanded across the country, uh, lots of economic pressure on individual households, and you know, it was fee for service, which is how we get paid. Was that the right way to take care of patients? So uh, we really had to look to the business world to try and uh, solve some of those problems. Uh, uh, frankly, our industry is way behind other industries, all right, uh, where other industries have, you know, developed a, a phone or a technology, and every year it got better and the price came down. In our industry, our expenses match the increases in rates we've received, whether it was from the federal government, CMS, or commercial payers. Uh, it's just not right. Uh, and we really needed to be have a breakaway moment where we could start to figure out how to take care of more people, 
at a lower cost and maintain or improve the quality. Uh, we, we, we learned a lot from the business side uh, around process improvement, uh, performance improvement, uh, queuing theory, and how we could move people in and out faster, and, and how there are other, uh, if you will, contractual arrangements that you can build with payers, whether that's a commercial payer or a self-insured company, to, to do a better job for their, their employees and beneficiaries at a lower cost. Uh, uh, so we spent a lot of time on the business side, uh, and, uh, and I, as much as I don't want to talk about healthcare, taking care of humans as a business, there is a business component to it. But there is also uh, a human component. One Huge. of the things that you cannot do is you cannot plan for uh, profit maximization first. You can't. You have to really, uh, if, uh, to do this ethically, you have to a plan for the best sure. outcomes for the patients first. Yeah, right. So in, in addition to process optimization, the goal of process optimization mm -hmm. is just different. It's not to create shareholder value or, mm -hmm. uh, or dividends at the end of, uh, of some announcement mm -hmm. here. It's to, the thing that you want to announce is we served our community better. Mm -hmm. we, we provided better health, health, sure. uh, health outcomes. Mm -hmm. And that creates a, a completely different sensibility and ethic that permeates mm -hmm. all of your people. Yeah, it does. Uh, and we're fortunate in that regard. Uh, you know, keeping the patient uh, foremost in our mind uh, is our inspiration. I would tell you, though, uh, you know, never miss the opportunity to exploit a crisis. Uh, so the Affordable Care Act in 2010, while you didn't have a lot of fans in the in healthcare industry for it, there was inescapable uh, excitement uh, around fee for value, value-based reimbursement. Fee for value. Yeah. So, so the whole idea is that every dollar that is being spent is creating the best impact for the patient. Exactly right. There's actually an equation: value equals quality divided by cost, or V equals Q divided by C. Ironically, before the Affordable Care Act, uh, our organization had been using that to make some of our decisions. So uh, we embraced value, and what that really meant to us was, you know, fee for service is fine. We do a lot of, we provide a lot of services that we get paid for. It's transactional, but caring for humans over time, longitudinally, it's a bad way to take care of populations. Uh, I now refer to fee for service as kind of perverse fee for service. All right, uh, uh, there are per, there are dirty fee for service dollars. I'll give you an example. You know, if we know there's a person that has rising clinical risk for something bad to happen in their life, if we have accrual awareness of that, right. right, the business kind of concept, you need to act. You need to put it in the journal. You need to act on that. And we don't have systems in healthcare that allow us to, well, we, we're worried about that, but what do you do about it? You wait well, till it comes in. Well, the whole idea of preventive, right? Until right. it's necessary, what you're, what you're saying is preventive yeah. is, is very often the most cost effective, the highest quality outcomes come from that early investment, yes. but it's not the thing that a, that a calculation would would justify. You're exactly right. And we stumbled around for decades around that. You remember the buzzwords corporate wellness, right. you know, and we do cholesterol screenings for the masses. And surely those are important things. Blood pressure checks, surely those are good things, no doubt. But it's for the masses. And 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 suddenly when you start to look at who your customer is, again as a business kind of challenge, who's the consumer? It's our patients. Who are they? What do they need? What segments are most vulnerable? When you really start to dive in on that, you learn a couple things. And guess what? 20% of Americans drive 80% of $3.7 trillion of cost. 20%, all right? 10% drive about 40%, okay? 1.5%, frankly, of our own health plan, about 28,000 employees and dependents. 1.5%, uh, about 500 people, drives over $30 million of our $130 million spend. So one recognition early on is if you want to solve this economic problem, because there isn't enough money right, right now in a fee-for-service world, there has to be a new economy. Um, if you know who the people are that are driving that cost and somehow you can do something to improve their outcome and avoid bad outcomes, everybody does better. So we keep hearing that the United States has the best health care sure. system in the world. Mm -hmm. But then the thing that follows always has struck me as being a little bit odd mm -hmm. because it seems that what follows is there's reference to research for very complicated conditions, mm -hmm. which is really important to do. Mm -hmm. But that is sort of the, 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 the top most rarefied area mm -hmm. of health. Mm -hmm. which neglects the mass of people uh -huh. who actually receive health care. So are sure. we justifying 
with that argument, high costs for low benefit, mm -hmm. right? It, I mean, it, it just it just seems that there's a different argument to make, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure that I actually mm -hmm. uh, buy the sense that that research can't proceed. Mm -hmm. uh, with a different model in any of that. Neither do we. Um, you're right. And I, I do believe we have the best uh, health care services in, 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 in the world. It's why people come from other countries to get certain things done here, right? right. Um, I think where we fall down is in, in execution, all right, and in how we allocate the resources to care for those people that really uh, need proactive care, they need uh, additional, perhaps even, and this is not a social justice comment, uh, disproportionate care, all right? Uh, what we found in the 5% of the people that drive 50, 60% of cost in the Lehigh Valley, just our region, is that the, the people that are highly concentrated there are three groups of people. Socially isolated, financially fragile seniors. Right. Okay, remember our seniors, 70% of American seniors are dependent on Social Security as their only source of income. And they're living really long. Many with walkers and no cars or access to get to a doctor, no, or no less any uh, le extra money for a copay for or their medicines. Or or uh, electrically. So these are the devices, the device costs themselves can be in excess of what they can afford. I, I don't even think they're on their radar. It's just out of reach. Right. Um, the other group that's in that concentration of 5% are those that are socio so socially or economically obstructed that have challenges. Think maybe medical assistance, Medicaid, uh, uninsured individuals, low-income in individuals. And in, in our community, also I put on that list veterans that either don't use their benefit or are unaware, perhaps, of the value of their benefit. We found that if by giving them disproportionate access, care, meeting them where they are to give them what they need, most times not a doctor. Most times it's a human being on the phone or, or someone just there meeting with them to actually tell them we care. How can we help you? What are your problems? Uh, you know, we hear these stories all the time. One of the most important organizations in our community is Meals on Wheels, all right? That social isolation issue with seniors is, is a terrible one. And they, they tend to be the best friends. They wait by the door many times uh, to, for the Meals on Wheels person to come there because they're a friend. There's someone to talk to. Those are, th that's the focus. If we, we really get down to taking care of humans, it isn't always a medical solution. You know, those top really whiz-bang surgeries that people fly in from all over the world to get. It's about how do we allocate resources to those people that we know are on a bad path. And it, they're going to show up in the emergency department. And sadly, we're going to take the leg off instead of the toe. And we had awareness that they were in tough straits. But were we on top of them? Were we there to really help? That's the focus. And I think a not-for-profit ethic helps drive us there. We don't care about getting paid more for a, a whiz-bang procedure if we can take care of the patient better. And that is the alignment that we have with the payers because it's lower trend costs, it's lower episode costs. Keeping that, you know, diabetic, uh, hypertensive, 80-year-old uh, 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 congestive heart failure patient out of the hospital nine times a year because they can't get their prescription filled for a cheap medicine, cut me a break. Dr. Brian Minister, thank you so much for sharing with us the phenomenal work of the Lehigh Valley Health Network. Thank you so much for your service to, to us. And thank you so much for your oh, insights. Thank you kindly.